Welcome everybody to our fourth episode of our weekly summer interview series, Ruskin Asks, run by the Ruskin Geography Department and Eco Committee. Following some fascinating episodes looking at conservation work in Africa, Asia and climate mitigation on a global scale, this week we're very excited to welcome our third guest. Um, joining us recently from America, Harry Wilkinson. Harry, thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. So Harry is a marine ecologist and protected species observer. I think I've got that right. Yeah, that's the one. Absolutely. And recently been studying uh, sea mammals, including whales, dolphins uh, and other cetaceans. So hopefully today we'll find out a little bit more about that work, um, some really interesting stories from previous work and try and get a little bit of help and advice for you in your future as well. Um, so, Harry, I've, I've sort of briefly outlined what you do. Do you want to tell us a little bit more specifically sort of what your most recent project is, what your work's been that you've been doing? Yeah, absolutely. So, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so, I'm a marine ecologist, protected species observer, and mainly my job is mitigating against uh, human interference in the marine environment, impacts on wildlife, impacts on the environment, on different coastlines, and what's going on on the surface of the sea and below the sea on the sea floor all of it included in one. So mainly, uh, as Nick said, we look at whales, dolphins, other cetaceans, uh, but not only mammals, we also look at uh, sea turtles and sharks, for instance, like that. Um, by mitigating, I mean, um, I just recently got back from an American project where I worked for five months, and they're building a new wind farm off the eastern coast of the seaboard there. Uh, it's the largest wind farm on the eastern coast. And of course, that takes a lot of work. So there's a lot of drilling going on and a lot of other geophysical things they're doing to make sure they can actually put the wind turbines in. So, of course, that's causing a lot of um, it's, it's impacting the environment a lot over there. So that's where I come in to make sure that um, there's no whales in the vicinity when they start working. There's no dolphins, there's no sea, uh, sea turtles. If there are sea turtles or whales in there, I can make an assessment and delay operations and let uh, these animals pass through or just hang out or just the animals come first, basically. So um, we annoy a lot of people because unfortunately <laughs> we do have the power to stop multi-million operations if there is a sea turtle just swimming by at a very slow pace. And we, get, we have to give them the green light to do their work in the first place. So that's what I did. That's a, I, I love the idea that one slightly slow sea turtle can hold up a multi-million pound project. Yeah. Um, uh, did you have, were there many delays? Did you find many impacts with this one? Uh, so on this particular job, uh, the job's still going on after five months, even I had to get out of there just for a little break. Um, but at last count, I believe we had something, we had close to 600 uh, detection events so the de detection events are just when a animal or a group of animal or multiple animals all appear at once. So we had about 600 detection events and close to a thousand individual species that had shown up over the period of five months. So we could go three weeks and not see anything and then we'd have 40 in a single day. So yeah, and uh, as you said about one sea turtle holding things up, um, I thought I was speaking to a colleague actually, she's from Canada, and she's been telling me stories about how um, one seal just kept coming up every 20 minutes or so and delaying in operation for about seven hours. Just one curious seal. It's cute when it starts, but then the crew starts to get a bit annoyed, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, the pressure. yeah. Is, is this an area you've done a lot of work in then, or do you sort of move about with the work? Uh, we move about with the work. With the work, I mean, mainly this is a ten-year job. This wind farm going up on the eastern coast. I can't say exactly where and stuff because so many different companies involved. But it's on the eastern seaboard of America. But I've done work in the North Sea as well. Um, that was a that was a decommissioning project. We were taking up pipeline that had been down there for decades. So we obviously had to be there. Uh, did some work off the east coast of England uh, near Ipswich, which was a uh, UXO which was basically uh, explosives. Lots of World War II bombs have been left over and they're still down there. So they're building a wind farm down there. So we had to go out and assess the area and work with some crazy people, some crazy uh, ex-marine divers who would go down with a bomb and attach it to the bigger bomb. And then we set off the bomb. <laughs> and I'm, I'm there basically to make sure that they don't accidentally blow up a whale or a seal or anything like that. So yeah, there's a bit of diversity in the jobs I do, but mainly America and England at the moment. But um, 
hoping for that um, call that says, oh, we need someone in Antarctica for six months or the Galapagos or, you know, dreams. But we'll I'd see. be looking for the Caribbean, I think. That would be yeah, nice. somewhere, like, I don't know, when you're on a steel ship and it's about 42 degrees and you're trying to sleep, it's... Ah, so uh, the cooler the better, is it? Yeah, in cooler oh. climates, there's more animals, I think. It's, uh, yeah. yeah. So. so is your work very project specific or does your data get used uh, sort of in a wider context as well? So the data we collect, uh, we, co we don't only collect data just on, oh, we saw a whale over there. <laughs> we, we collect uh, everything from um, the species, the number of species, the exact GPS location of the species that we see, their direction of travel, the time of travel, and then we take in all the environmental factors. What was the sea state like? Was it choppy? Was it windy? Was it raining? Just to impact all these things. Then we put other notes. Um, were we drilling at this particular time? Was there any abnormal behavior in the animal? Uh, because uh, I've got a video of uh, humpback whales lobtailing, lob tailing which is basically them just being on the surface and just slapping their tails vigorously against the surface of the ocean. And um, many people think that's due to uh, unknown noises in the area. It, I mean, it's open to discussion. Obviously, we can't ask a whale, why are you doing this? But there's um, talk of it being anthropogenic impacts, just like the level of noise in the ocean. Like a, a, a stress response. Yeah, if you will, or an unknown response, or it's communication with other whales. I mean, we don't really know. There's many different theories. But yeah, things like that. Yeah. Brilliant. So does that give you a pretty good idea of the health of the oceans that you're looking at? Um, obviously, we'd like to see more and more species in certain areas. But again, depending on the time of year, on the temperature of the ocean, and obviously certain mitigating, uh, mitigating uh, migration patterns of these animals about where they're coming. Um, yeah, it can give us a good indication of the species in the area. And obviously all our data that we collect goes off to universities, to marine organisations, and obviously they've got years to mm. compare to. So if we bring up something that's abnormal or an anomaly, they can look into it and compare and cross-reference. So it really does help. But the main thing of the data that we are collecting on this eastern seaboard at the moment is uh, there's the North Atlantic right whale, uh, an incredibly rare species of whale that's yeah. been hunted throughout life of humans uh, and that's why it's called the right whale because it was the right whale to hunt it was the easiest one to hunt and there's only from last time i checked there's about 500 plus individuals left in the wild so basically on our system if we were to see a north atlantic right whale and put it into the system there are alarms going up everywhere mm. i'm pretty sure if we put it in the system within about an hour there'd be helicopter server and video recorders everything so um, and they, they're carving at the moment, so they were about a month ago, I believe. Um, so strike avoidance as well. And strike avoidance is there's a lot of boat traffic, and these whales, they like to come up to the surface. They like to mill around, and obviously there's boats coming along. They don't see them. They get hit. So big, big awareness for the North Atlantic right whale. So, yeah. Is your relationship with the university sort of back and forth when you give them the information? Do they come back to you and sort of say what it means and the context? Or is it just very much you pass it on and, and they do what they do with it? It's pretty. I'm not even sure what universities it goes to. Right. It's, uh, I'm pretty sure we just collect the data. We analyze the data. We send it to them or we send it to our we send it to our boss. We send it to our establishment and then it gets distributed from there. Okay, I mean, you may or may not be able to answer this next bit, but uh, there's a lot of sort of stuff in the media at the moment about the health of the oceans and um, their response to climate change being perhaps even greater than what we're seeing on land. Uh, does, is that something reflected in what you see? Are you seeing um, positive news stories or, or is there some worries for you in what you're seeing in the oceans? Um, obviously, I mean, the biggest threats to oceans at the moment you could be all, all human related everything can come back to anthropogenic impact i mean uh, there was a recent oil spill uh, off mm -hmm. the top of my head i can't remember where it was it was in the news oil spill oil yes i did read about it yeah i can't where <laughs> it's all over my head where it was but yeah oil in the ocean is massive obviously uh boat traffic again as i've mentioned striking if you're in big ships and you're going at a reasonable rate if you hit a whale it will damage the ship but it's most likely going to kill the whale, 100%, and then one that we should all be aware of, I hope everybody is aware of, plastic. Yes, um, hopefully our students uh, will. Yes, students, listen. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, this is actually a good thing, talking directly to your students, when you have a birthday party or you have a celebration, 
don't use balloons, please. Because everybody has balloons and they let them go into the air. 99% of the time, they land in the ocean. Over the, over the five months, we actually kept record of it, a record of it. So even when we're out, we're doing our job, we're on the boats and everything like that. I think we collected close to something like 37 balloons within a month. So it was pretty much one a day, a couple of day kind of thing. I mean, I don't know how many they've collected since then. Mm. But yeah, these balloons fully blown up. They're just in the ocean. So and obviously sea turtles like to eat them because they look like jellyfish. Fish, uh, they can get trapped in boat propellers. I mean, that's not for the animals, but they can cause damage and so on. So yeah, please don't use balloons. Um, another one would be the amount of overfishing. Overfishing is mm. ridiculous in some areas. And there are... I don't know if I can say this on YouTube without getting uh, reprimanded, but let's say there are some uh, leaders around the world, um, well-known leaders in the Western part of the world, who um, have opened up um, overfishing areas, areas that are allowed to be fished, and with no consequence, no thought of the consequence of what it could do to the ecosystem as a whole. Mm. So things like that. And then obviously little things like what we do, like drilling, Obviously, we do uh, environmental assessments of areas and say, okay, can we drill here? We're not drilling into a coral reef. We're not drilling into this. We're not drilling into that. We're okay to do it here. So things like that. And then, obviously, climate change. Climate change is impacting temperature rise. Um, yeah, temperature rise and just destruction of coastal habitats is a big thing that I've read about. I've not particularly seen it, obviously, from where I've worked. It's not really near mangroves or anything like that. But deforestation on the coastal line and coastal uh, degradation is, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of positives in the world at the moment with what we're trying to do, but there's a lot of negatives that we need to fix and get aware of as soon as possible. I'd definitely like to hear more about the positives, but if we could just go into a couple of those issues in a little bit more detail. Miss Hutchinson's just informed me it was Mauritius where the oil spill was, I think. Uh, so there thank you very much, Miss Hutchinson. Um, it's really interesting. Obviously, our students will, will hear about all these things. But actually... There's a dog. Sorry. Uh, Someone's actually... actually been there and seen it. It's interesting to hear your, your first hand account. And particularly, you know, the balloons shows that connection between what we're doing here and there. Um, could you dig in perhaps a little bit more detail what the actual impacts of climate change are on the ocean? Because I don't know how obvious they are first. Um, okay, so from where I've been doing this particular job, um, I've not seen a lot like suddenly. Obviously, climate change is a slow process as well. We're not gonna, unless we see it. <laughs> sorry, can you sort her, please? Uh, sorry about that. Um, um, so climate change, there's not been a lot, it's a very slow change. We can see it's happening, but it is happening whether it's the melting of ice caps and sea level rise, or whether it's the destruction of certain or overfishing is destruction of certain species that are impacting it. But let's take um, Australia, coral bleaching. I was lucky mm -hmm. enough to be in Australia a couple of years ago, and I was lucky to swim on the Great Barrier Reef. And having seen pictures of it, what it looked like before compared to what I saw it as, it's, it's a different world of, what, mm -hmm. of what, what's happening over there. I mean, cor coral bleaching, it can be caused by just slight increase in temperatures in the sea which is causing it uh, as well as obviously marine uh, human waste going in into the ocean directly from the coast but uh coral they need specific conditions in order to reproduce i mean many people are actually under the assumption that coral are just rocks that they're just pretty rocks that are colorful that they're not they're living organisms that move around that they breed and they require very particular conditions in order to do this so when they breed, they usually all do it at once. It's a brilliant uh, thing that happens in our world. But um, right now, with the increase in temperature, they're just not being able to do that. They're losing uh, the calcium they need in order to actually reproduce themselves and actually grow. And that means they're losing all that color. And obviously, they're, they're dying very, very slowly. And obviously, it just creates a little domino effect as it goes. If the coral dies, uh, the species that depend on the coral won't be able to survive as well. They die, things that eat them, they die, so on, so on, so on. I mean, a perfect example of just the, an example of little and large, if you will. And uh, the Arctic climate, say polar ice caps are melting. There's a species of Antarctic krill. Uh, krill are tiny, tiny little organisms 
that are fed on by one of the largest, take it, whales. Mm -hmm. And Antarctic krill, they breed on the underside of icebergs or underside of coal things. So they they reproduce in the billions, that, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But if you were to take away their ability to reproduce, these Antarctic krill act as a food source for thousands of species. And if you were to take that food source away, say from the whales, then you're looking at the smallest creature in the world disappearing. And then you're looking at one of the largest creatures in the world not being able to th thrive. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's an example of climate change. I mean, whether or not we're going to see any sudden direct impact straight away, but it is happening over the long term. It's something we should all be very aware of. Already seeing those impacts. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that stunned me and my sixth formers all know this from our A level, just how constant conditions have been in the ocean, certainly over recent history. And things like with the with the coral, as you mentioned, the heat, but also um the acid levels. So mm. uh, the pH has been around eight point two for millions of years, and suddenly ever so slow ever so quickly that starting to see a change which could have that impact as well um yeah you say those obviously it's, yeah obviously the acidification is not good for corals whatsoever it rocks them it has a very negative effect on them and it's something we, we should be able to solve in the future mm. but it's uh, uh what was it uh, i can't remember the statistic it's something like uh well take the country of australia for example 90 percent of its people live on the coast mm. It's so big. Not many people live in the center. Everybody lives on the coast. So a lot of waste goes into the water there and a lot of impacts, whether they're building new cities, built buildings, it has an impact on the ocean, on the coast. So, yeah, there's lots of things we need to do. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, in this day and age, people around the world, we are we want to live as fast as possible, as quickly as possible. And everybody seem everybody seems to be out for themselves and it's a lot of people who i've spoken to in the past especially where i've worked it's oh well that's not going to affect me or that doesn't affect mm. me it's um the, the way i like to see it is if it doesn't affect them directly they are not bothered why should someone in um kansas in the middle of america can't get much further from the sea be bothered about the coral reef over in australia how does that affect me? Never even gone, not bothered. So it's things like that that annoy yeah, me. Yeah, I mean, we never <laughs> like to sort of dwell on the negatives, but I think it is important for people to understand that actually, yes, what's happening a long way away can have an impact on you. You might yeah. not understand it right now, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Um, exactly. And well, then the positives, I suppose. You, you mentioned that there's there's a lot of good things going on. I suppose whales would be one of those um what are, what are sort of the big positives well we've got marine management areas now which are really really good uh which are obviously like uh we have i'm oh, trying to trying to think of a specific example uh let's take going back to the boats uh of strike avoidance we've now got mitigation of uh yeah mitigation actions in effect such as reducing the boat speed in areas you from now on you can't go as fast as you want mm -hmm. for as long as you want i don't care in certain areas, no ship is allowed to go faster than 10 knots, which is about eight miles an hour or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, so obviously that gives more time for people to spot things before running them over, if you will. Um, yeah, there's large marine ecosystem management areas in places like South Africa, which is really good. Uh, but then there's two different levels of the good stuff for marine management areas. You can look at it as a top-down approach which is like, say, the government says, OK, you're not allowed to do this. You can only go at this speed, blah, 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 bang, bang, bang. And then the little person does it. That's the top down approach. Bottom up approach is a lecturer that I went to actually a couple of years ago from my university was in Madagascar, where the local people in Madagascar, a certain area of beat, uh, they were overfishing octopus, octopus, mm -hmm. uh, because octop octop eh, octopuses, octop octopi, octopuses, um, they grow quite quickly so what they encouraged the local people to do was instead of just constantly fishing these octopuses up uh, instead of constantly fishing them they divided up their area of beach into four segments and said okay this is what you're going to do you're going to fish these three sections and only these three sections for the next three months you're not going to touch this section mm -hmm. and eventually they agreed to it so they only fished those and they were getting octopuses which were about you know like this 
And then after three months, they were allowed to go and hunt in this section that they'd left alone. And they were bringing out octopuses that were absolutely massive. They were shocked. They were so impressed with it. And obviously, they had allowed the regeneration in that particular area that, to just go ahead and be natural and not touch it. So, and then from there, as far as I'm aware, they've kept that up. So every three months, they'll switch which bit they do. So that's a bottom-up approach in how the people are using mm. the environment and letting it regenerate and not overfishing it and being able to control it and keep it sustainable. And also with those octopuses being able to grow to a relative rate, they're, uh, they're able to breed more, they're able to have more of an impact on the environment and so on. So those are a few positive things going there. Which is good. Well, that's excellent to hear. Uh, and I think that's one thing that's always amazed me: how quickly things will recover if it's just a lot oh, yeah. of time to rest. Like these, these places have managed themselves brilliantly for long enough <laughs> without us. Um, yeah. what, what do you think the key is to convincing people to listen to those messages? Oh, that really does depend on where you are in the world. I mean, some people want to listen. Some people really don't want to listen. Some people, again, as we said before, about oh, does it affect me? I'm not bothered. Mm. But um, it's really education is key. Education is fundamental from a young age. If we can get young people to learn and appreciate what they have, excuse me, from the environment at a very young age, then obviously they can take that on further. But trying to get, uh, say, an older generation to change their ways at this particular time it is difficult. But that's when we look at the examples like in Madagascar, where we say, look, Let's show you what it can be like. Mm, once they've seen. Yeah, so I believe that a lot of people around the world, they need to see things. They need to see things to believe it, and they can then they'll go from there. And then, obviously, those people in Madagascar, they benefited directly from it. Yeah. And so they were happy. They were going, oh, this is great. This is fantastic. This is great for us. Bang. And then they take it on, and they'll pass that on, hopefully. So... Yeah, and then obviously the other thing is, which links to another paper that I did on ecosystem services, is if I were to ask you, Nathan... Um, Preempted my question there. <laughs> yeah, if I was to ask you, what's the one language around the world everybody can understand? Um, I'd either say English or money. <laughs> Boom, you got it. You got it in one, money. So ecosystem services is something that I did for my dissertation in my master's. Uh, and... So ecosystem services can be defined as what uh, a certain section of the environment, the environment as a whole, a particular area or a particular species can give to us as humans. What can they provide us? And you can, I broke it down into several different categories, uh, very, very simple ones, such as food, uh, raw materials, uh, entertainment value, uh, there's religion and cultural experiences. Um, and then you can go into what that species or the, what that part of the environment does for the environment that benefits us. So there was a paper in 1997, I believe it was, Constauer, Constau, I think, I think that's how you pronounce it. Say. Mm -hmm. um, he valued the environment as a whole at something like $127 trillion or something like that. So I tried to instead of valuing the entire Mother Nature, I tried to just focus on a particular species, which was sea turtles. So I looked at what is the worth of the sea turtle. And eventually I broke it down into, okay, they can be used as a food source, they can be used as raw materials. There are countries around, there are cultures around the world that prize them as a, almost like a, a deity level. I mean, leatherback turtles in Southeast Asia, they can be revered as well. But if you look in the Gulf of Mexico, sea turtle eggs are a delicacy. They constantly eat them green turtles were been farmed for years they were you they were once the most valuable reptile in the world because they could live so long in the hull of ships going mm. from america and england so they were used as a food source so all of those things you can take into account but obviously coming up with a figure at the end of it is incredibly difficult to do yeah, arbitrary but, yeah but what i'd like to do is what you say about getting people's attention and what we can do to understand if i walk down the street in england and say um, oh, the green turtle, it's going extinct. And they're going to go, okay, cool. <laughs> but if I can say the green turtle's going extinct and each green turtle is valued at $100 million, they hear, hold on, wait, $100 million? 
and then they can literally they can put it into a concept that they can filter mm. they can say a hundred million dollars it must be important i mean certainly that should spark discussion and interest shouldn't it exactly because money is the one thing everybody <laughs> around the world it's understands. The, one of the big debates i have with my sixth formers and my gcse students quite often is actually whether ecosystem services is the right way to do it um because yeah. we look at the different levels of value so whether it has an instrumental value you only want it because it can provide something yeah. or whether it has a value in and of itself so you seem quite big on the, the the ecosystem services you seem to see the value in that particularly do you think that's um something we should use to start the discussion or do you think that's what it should that should be the, the main focus of it when you get down to it <sighs> Obviously, there, there's a slight difference between value and worth, yes. if you will. And also, there's one man's trash is another man's treasure. Uh, as I said before, some countries around the world revere certain species. Others hunt them. Some consider them deities. Some consider them irrelevant. They, they're just there kind of thing. So I really do think that question should be as in... It depends where you are in the world, because we can't go to everywhere in the world, to every country in the world, every culture in the world, and ask them the same question. It's got to be tailored to that specific environment and that specific situation in order to get those people, that community, that establishment to understand what it is that specific environment, that specific area is doing for them. So it really is um, a unique, you've got to change it to suit the situation. Mm. So do you yeah. think it's it's a valuable exercise for each and every endangered species to calculate its monetary value? Oh, there was th there was this question that got posed to our lecture group, and I think I was the only one who put up my hand saying, <laughs> should a monetary value be applied to say, or you can't do it for every species in the world. Mm -hmm. you, 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 it's physically impossible. Mm -hmm. But say if you were to take uh, a humpback whale, a tiger, a great white shark, a polar bear, things that people know, and try and apply it. I mean, I, as I said, money is the language we all understand. I do think it would be a good way of getting more attention to it. So whether or not people can do that, I mean, it would be a lot of investment, a lot of time, a lot of research. And obviously it would fluctuate continuously because obviously if a population is, if you've got a X amount, if you've got a thousand of this particular species, but then 500 of them disappear, is their value going to go up individually? Is it going to go down? Like, mm, like that. Yeah. So, so so I, think, I mean, it's already sparked a conversation here, hasn't it? So hopefully yeah. it's, uh, it's what you're saying people yeah. don't necessarily understand or value. Hopefully that's that's a way to, to get into it. Um, yeah. but certainly, I think the ecosystem services idea is one that's vital for young people understanding uh, mm. how the world works and connects. I think that's a really interesting one. Yeah. Uh, so we've spoken a fair bit there about sort of your current job, but by no means are you restricted to marine species. Um, you've you've had quite the, the experiences, haven't you? Uh, I've been incredibly lucky and incredibly fortunate to do what I've been able to do. Um, so I do have a website if anybody wants to check it out. Mr. Hutchinson, and if you can uh, sort that out if anybody wants yeah, to yeah, see we'll it. Yeah, we'll link it in. But um, yeah, so after university, when I left when I was 21, I went to Liverpool, Liverpool Hope, not the main Liverpool, if anybody's, you know, li you know the mediocre one. <laughs> um, I went to that one and I did geography and I had no idea, no idea what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to travel. So I worked in a cafe for a couple of months and saved up for as much as, a, much as possible for something I didn't even know I wanted. But I knew I wanted to travel and I knew I wanted to go back to Africa. So I saved up and I did a lot of research and I found an online uh, game ranging course. So game ranging is, if anybody has been to Africa and been on safari or seen it on the TV in one of David Attenborough's programs, um, I was training to be one of the guys who was in one of the safaris who would pick you up in the morning and then drive you around Africa and show you lion, leopard, buffalo, cheetah, all of that. So I was training to be one of those. So I bought a one-way ticket to South Africa and took a massive risk and did a course for a few months and passed, which was great. Um, that would have been a but then. Yeah, it would have been annoying if it had failed. But uh, no, I loved it. Africa, um, for anybody who's not been to Africa, I'm incredibly jealous of you because you get to experience it again for the first time. And Africa is a very, very, very special country. 
Uh, and it's Any hard student to... I've taught will be sick of hearing that. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's very hard to explain what Africa is, especially to me. It's it's not just a country, it's a smell, it's a people, it's culture, it's the dust in your hair, it's, it's ridiculous, just go. Um, but yeah, so I did that in Africa and we were lucky enough to work on the, they have a Born Free Foundation and for anybody who doesn't know what the Born Free Foundation is, it's where they look and rehabilitate big cats that can't be released into the wild and uh, got a couple of sad stories and a couple of positive stories but um, a lot of the animals there were neglected and they were in circuses there was one lion, I can't remember his name it was like Tivu or something he was in a circus for the majority of his life but he'd had all his teeth ripped out with pliers uh, so obviously they, he was rescued and he was brought back to his natural habitat but they're in fences, but they're in their natural habitat. So it's the best they can do. They obviously can't be released into the wild because he'd be dead within two days. So um, he was fed uh, liquid food, but at least he got to survive and have a good life. Uh, there were these leopard triplets, which were incredibly close to my heart. I loved them a lot. They were incredible. I took one of my best photos of them. That's on the website. Um, <laughs> but they, I believe they were found in a shoebox in France somewhere of course you couldn't get further away from Africa they were found in a shoebox in France on the street or something or in a run down apartment and of course they they were saved and brought back to South Africa but again they couldn't be released into the wild so they've been kept in like a an open enclosure and mm. they've been allowed to live but uh one of the worst ones was a lioness who couldn't be around other lions or anything like that she was also found in France and she'd been kept as a pet from a very, very young cub. I think she was bought from a circus or something. Um, she was kept in a very small apartment in France, and she was fed KFC, McDonald's, Pizza Hut, and everything like that. So she had a lot of brain damage, and her, her muscles had grown, but her bones hadn't. So when I first saw her, she was lying on the ground, and she looked like a normal lion, except one of her eyes was a bit off. But when I started walking down the fence, she stood up. And when I say stood up, she her bones were maybe half a foot off the ground, but all her muscles were sagging. So all her muscles were dragging on the ground, but her bones, she was... Think of it like a sausage dog. That's how she was walking. Oh, that's so sad for such a magnificent creature. Yeah, yeah. and then obviously there's other ones. There's, there's horror stories with elephants and especially rhino as well. I was lucky enough to go to, uh, we were in Kenya a couple of years ago and we got to see Sudan. He was the last male northern uh, white rhino. We got to go and see him and that was about two months before he died. So, but yeah, I, again, I've got a lot of people who are still in Africa who will keep me informed of things going on and poachers are annoying to say the least. That's the kindest rude, uh, kindest word I can use that isn't rude to define poachers. But uh yeah, rhinos that have been darted with uh, unnecessary volumes of uh, anis uh, of what do you call it? Sleep. Yeah, stuff. anesthetic. Not, uh, anesthetic. Thank you. Uh, of anesthetic, uh, and they just they half pass out. They fully pass out, but they've had their horns or the front of their face with a chainsaw just taken off while they're still alive, which isn't the nicest thing anybody wants to hear. So I'm sorry about that, but it, it's a reality. And then they're just left. Yeah, like it's, I mean, it's hard to hear, but I think it's important yeah. that people understand the issues, don't they? And I mean, good yeah. news that there's there's people out there to help them, but sad news yeah. that they're needed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was actually something that I read a couple of years ago. It was because uh, uh, this is where it comes into cultural and belief. I mean, there are certain areas in the world that believe uh, ivory or anything like that can help cure cancer, can make you incredibly fertile, can help with this or life, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. It doesn't do anything. Um, but apparently, if you were to use a chemical that dyes rhino horns pink, yes. it, it would actually stop them from being used. So I had this crazy image in my head of just hundreds of rhinos running around Africa with a bright pink fluorescent horn. I mean, I'd rather that than than be shot. We had the black mambas on in our first episode, who were an anti poaching unit in Kruger yeah. National Park. Um, and I used to live with one of the ladies who works there. And we've had all these discussions. They're dyeing it pink, flooding the market with synthetic horn. You know, yeah. there's, there's a lot of solutions out there. Unfortunately, people always seem to find a way around, don't they? Um, yeah. 
but there's, there's a lot of people out there trying and, and you know we've heard some good news stories we've heard some progress um yeah. so that's africa you've you've been all over you've been australia yeah uh after africa i bought a one-way ticket to new zealand where this wasn't so much with the animals but this was just the, the landscapes if that, again africa's number one new zealand's number two <laughs> go to new zealand uh it's incredible and for any uh me, any movie nerds out there i worked at hobbiton oh. which is which is the movie set where they filmed the lord of the rings i was lucky enough to be a tour guide on there because i'm a fantastic nerd for that kind of thing so uh spent there for a couple of months i didn't uh, think more jealous <laughs> it, it's a, oh it was incredible yeah yeah oh I, i'm not gonna get all soppy about it but it's, it's quite a special place uh, yeah uh, yeah but uh, after new zealand i spent a year in new zealand and then i moved to australia where I actually got an email from someone saying, um, because they were going through an incredibly bad drought in Australia at the time. It was like their worst drought in 100 years or something like that. And I got a call saying, look, we can't do our boat experiences the way we should because we haven't got any water on the floodplains, but we need a terrestrial land guide. Uh, can you come and do it? So I got on a plane and flew to Darwin, which is in the Northern Territory of Australia. Um, and I worked at a place called Bamaru. Bamaru Luxury Lodges, which is uh, a little bit west of Kakadu, and it's in it's in the middle of nowhere. When I say in the middle of nowhere, it's in the middle of nowhere. We had to get a plane in and out of it sometimes, or it was a six-hour drive. And that So that was a five-star luxury lodge. And again, I was a game ranger, like what I've been trained to do in Africa. I was now doing it fully in Australia. And Australia is a little bit different from Africa. They obviously don't have lion, leopard, cheetah, elephant. They don't have that. What they do have is the crocodiles, which are quite interesting and scary because these are prehistoric creatures that if you look at one, you can see it knows. It just <laughs> knows what you're thinking. Um, and the wild brumbies, which are the wild horses, which are just roaming free, which is quite special. If you ever see a group of a uh, herd of 30 or 40 wild horses cantering past you in the sunset, it's quite special. Yeah, so, it's different way of seeing them, isn't it? We don't tend to think of them as wild animals, so it must be yeah. interesting to see it that way. Yeah, so um, these guests would show up, we'd pick them up from the airport, we'd take them back to their cabins, and they'd have incredible views of uh, the Australian landscape, uh, which should be flooded. It was supposed to be on the airboats, but again, we didn't have any water, which mm. was annoying, but we had to do the best of what we did. So we'd take them out on safaris and we'd show them the local, the, the buffalo the landscapes, we'd take them on track, uh, on trekking holiday, trekking trips through Australian bush, which was great, and talk to them about the snakes and the local habitats. And um, the, the guests got the really nice accommodation, of course. I got a tent, I got a tent with a hole in it um, and woke up to a snake or two every now and then, which was nice. Oh, uh, any dangerous ones? Uh, there was northern browns, which are incredibly venomous. Uh, they will bite you. But, um, oh, just to go back to Africa, actually, regarding the snakes, uh, the I did a snake handling course when I was in Africa, and that set me up for Australia as well, which was highly beneficial. But the stories coming from the snake handling and just living in Africa for my mentor, a guy by the name of Nils Kerr, anybody interested in Africa or big cats, Nils Kerr, N-I-L-S-K-U-R-E. He's probably the number one renowned world expert on leopards, and he's my mentor, and he's an incredible man. But... Um, He's, he told me stories about how he was driving down the road in Africa and there was this car on the side of the road with its doors open and it wasn't doing anything. So he got out and just checked and there was just a guy sat there cross-legged in front of his car with a cardboard sign and written on it in blood was bit by Black Mamba at 4 p.m. or something. Uh, so Black Mambas, um, that poaching group is saying, Black Mambas, there is a rule in Africa. If there's a snake in your house... Um, let it go, let, let, make sure a door's open so it can escape. You can get a rope. You can try and get it out that way if it's any snake. The only snake, if it's a black mamba in your house, it doesn't matter whether it's on your TV, your bed, kitchen, whatever, you go and get your gun, you come inside and you shoot it. Oh, wow. <laughs> because a black mamba will, it's one of the only snakes that will actually chase a human for pleasure. Really? It, it, it will chase you. And these things can get up to... I don't know, like something like 16, 15 feet long, and they can raise a third of their body off the ground. So you're talking a 15-foot snake 
uh, five foot off the ground, and it can strike three times that. So it's got a strike of 15 feet. And they can go at something like 18, 19 kilometers an hour. So it will catch you, and it will bite you, and you will die. Oh, wow. So, I didn't, I didn't yeah. know snakes that actually went after people. I assumed if you left them alone, you'd be all right. <laughs> Uh, major, a majority of snakes do that. They don't want to be disturbed, but unfortunately, it's just most of them are accidents. I mean, if you're walking mm. through there under a rock, they're in the dense brush, they're in the scrub. You step on one, it's going to bite you. Mm. So it's that. But black mambas will chase you. Like oh, that. Well, I bet that. <laughs> yeah. I know it's serious, but I have got a funny image in my head of chasing yeah. people. And yeah. Wow. So yeah, that, that was Africa, New Zealand, Australia. Uh, and then I did some non-work in, I went on holiday to Singapore and Borneo. Borneo was awesome for the orangutans and the, the pygmy elephants they have out there. And also uh, pygmy squirrels. If anybody likes cute animals, there's a pygmy squirrel about that big, which just jumps around the trees, which is really, really cool. Uh, Borneo is an incredibly special place, but under an increasing pressure of deforestation, littering and just general human waste. I mean, the hotel we were staying in after we'd done our trek in the in the jungles and things like that, uh, we, we were just seeing waves pile up there and it was just waves of garbage. It was waves of plastic just going up on the beaches and the rocks. And it was a good four or five kilometer coastline and it was just plastic. So all these places in the world that are shown on TV, like on David Attenborough, when he shows you all these lovely jungles with the orangutans and the elephants and the crocodiles, looks all very nice there. You go anywhere near the cities, it's a different world, which is obviously impacting the ocean and animals on land alike. So, yeah. Where were you in uh, Borneo? Because one of our guests was Ashley Lehman, who founded the Orangutan Foundation. Um so she's based in Kalimantan, uh, in oh. Lamandau Nature Reserve. I think we were in Sandakan. Was it Sandakan? I honestly can't remember. We flew into Sandakan, I think. Well, I think that's how you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. And then we drove. We went, I can't remember the name of the lodge we stayed at, or the orangutan center. Honestly, that's just gone completely over my head. I that suppose we've been so many places. But, <laughs> yeah, it's just, sorry. That's going to happen, isn't it? Um, yeah. What have been sort of some of the challenges you've faced? Um, you know, so in the from the physical environment. Uh, so let's go back to talking sea. So obviously, my my jobs vary about where I go. Uh, I can work in the North Sea, work in East Coast America. Sometimes I'm on a ship. I'm offshore, so we'll go on a big ship and we'll set out and we'll be at sea for two weeks. Come back, do a crew change, out again for two weeks. Uh, most people usually just do two weeks at a time, but me, I like to stay in as long as possible. So I got given I got given the nickname Bootstrap because part of the <laughs> ship, part of the crew, you never leave. So that was me. Uh, but regarding the weather conditions out there, last year we were so hurricane season is like the end of August, beginning of September kind of thing. Well, we we got on the tail end of one of those last year on a job when we were on the eastern coast, and it got to the point where I was standing up at three in the morning, holding the fridge up with one hand, the coffee maker on the other hand, and the captain of the ship was holding up the other freezer or something. The kitchen was gone. The, I remember the chef coming out and seeing his kitchen and just the microwave going from one side to the other, the smashing. He literally got up, looked at the kitchen and went, no, nah, and just went back to bed. <laughs> uh, we've had the back deck of a ship come up in the weather. Um, mm. Yeah, we've had serious waves. Obviously, we, we have a limit to what we can do on our job. If we can't see if there's a potential animal there, they can't work. But obviously, if it gets to that level, they shouldn't be working anyway, but it's not yeah. safe. But we've worked through torrential rain, ridiculously high seas, winds pushing 70, 80 knots, which is I don't know, 70 miles an hour, let's say. And when you're out at sea, there is nothing to break the wind. So it hits you, it hits you. And then... The temperature as well. Uh, I started working on a job in August last year in Boston, and the temperatures were early 30s, which was nice. It was hot during the day. It was great. But we, I worked all the way through till December 11th. So I'd gone from shorts and a T-shirt standing on deck to three layers, four jumpers, bracing against the snow and the sleet. Yeah, it does get cold, though. So, 
yeah. So we have a lot of weather conditions we have to deal with on there, but we've got to make our best assessment call because safety at sea is number mm. one. It prioritizes. Yeah, right. Yeah, it prioritizes everything safety at sea. Uh, but having said that, uh, we do the offshore work, but we also do inshore work. I mean, luckily this job I was just doing, we were inshore, uh, so I got to go home to a bed every single night. So we'd go out on the sea at like five thirty in the morning, get back at six p.m. And then I get to spend the night in an actual bed, which was nice. So the jobs vary. So, yeah. Brilliant. I mean, the, the number of experiences you must have had and, and the places you've been. Um, what? How do you think that sort of affected your, you've clearly got some clear views on, on people and, and the environment. How do you think your travels have, have shaped and affected those? Um, travel is one of the most fortunate things I've been able to do and also from my childhood uh, has had a big impact on that I was lucky enough to grow up in Dubai so I went to high school in Dubai from the age of 13 to 18 spent five and a half six years out there and Dubai being such a multicultural place as it is and having uh, my two best friends are uh, one's from Nigeria and one's from uh, uh, India Tanzania English mix kind of mm. thing uh, one of them's Christian one of them's Muslim it's so many different cultures, so many different religions I was lucky enough to grow up with and to be able to take that around the world because it's a very different scenario from if you've just grown up in England to, mm. say, being in Nottingham to then going and see how people live and act and behave in places like a Cape Town, an Oman, even Sydney, Australia. It's very, very different. So, yeah, I've been very, very lucky with that. And it's helped me deal with people as well. Especially when you're on a ship, you can't escape. You're on a ship, and you're stuck. So you've got to be able to get on with people and embrace everybody's cultural beliefs, everybody's religion, uh, personal beliefs, and just how they live. So that's really, really helped me a lot with that. Yeah. To be more sort of open minded, aware of yeah. different people's experiences of the world. Yeah. And how to deal with those people as well. It's. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a time where you've got to accept and step back and hold your tongue, but there's also times where you've got to take a stand and say, this is this, this is that, this is how I'm doing it. And you've got to come to some common ground. So, Have you found that an, an easy thing to do or has that been a difficult lesson? Uh, it's been a difficult lesson in some scenarios because obviously, again, you can't go anywhere when you're on a ship and you've also got to work with these people in very challenging conditions. And again, it just comes back to the background of how, of where people are from. If they've done one thing their entire life one way and I've done my thing my entire life one way, we come to an agreement sometimes, other times we don't. And then someone usually gets involved and says, shut up, we're doing it this way. And then you deal with it because when you're working at sea, mm. everybody's got to know what's going on in a safe environment. So, mm. yeah. Very interesting. I think particularly... Um for people who might not have had those experiences of other people's cultures as well. It might be interesting to hear uh, yeah. how you've handled that. Um, uh, unbelievably, there is one last bit of, of experience I'd still like to hear about. Um, yeah. your, your work in, in rewilding in Scotland. Yeah, so um, as anybody who knows me will tell you, uh, my, my favourite animal are the wolves. They are incredible species, and I've been fascinated them, fascinated with them since I was about four years old. I absolutely love them, uh, and I did a paper on them when I was for my dissertation when I was in university the first time at Liverpool, and then um, I did my travelling. I went to uh, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and the places, and then when I came back, uh, I think I was the only gap student to take a gap year. Um, to go to Australia and come back with more money than I went with, <laughs> which was a rare thing because uh, obviously I was living in a tent in Australia, so I wasn't paying any accommodation and then mm. like that, so I managed to save up a good amount of money. So I came back to England and um, I had this idea in my head that, oh yes, I'm gonna go to London and I'm going to do this and everything's gonna work out, I'm gonna get an apartment and I'm going to be head of the Zoological Society of London within a year and all of that, nah, it doesn't work that way. Uh, so I went to London and the guys who are, his name's Paul Lister, a uh, very nice man who's funding and he's trying to do the project up in Scotland, Allerdale Wilderness Reserve. He's trying to reintroduce wolves in Scotland. He's a very, very good man. Uh, and I would interviewed him for my project. So I got in touch with him when I went to London and I said, look, do you have any jobs? Can I come and do this? Can I come and do that? And unfortunately, there wasn't a job at the time, but I volunteered. 
So living in London without an actual paying job, and I was living in Wembley at the time, and I had to live I had to go into London. So it was an hour and a bit on the Piccadilly line every single day into London, uh, eight quid a train ride there and back or whatever it was, and then volunteering and not being able to do another job at the same time. I did some tried to do some bar work, but it's it's competition in London is very very fierce. Um, so I burnt through <laughs> all my savings uh, within about five months paying London rent, which was not good. <laughs> and at the end of it, it didn't accumulate in a job. It's just one of those things. There wasn't a position, there wasn't an opening, there wasn't the funds, number of reasons. It just didn't happen. Um, so that, so I applied for probably close to about 70 jobs, ranging from, again, bartender to uh, cleaning elephant poo up at Chester Zoo, like <laughs> grand mix. Which of those would you have preferred? Elephant poo, hundred <laughs> percent, hundred. I will never bartend again. I did that for a number of years. No, never again. Um, but um, yeah, the same. The thing that kept coming back to me was in. I was twenty four at the time, and it was um, the question that came back was, "Do you have twelve years of experience?" <laughs> of course not. Uh, or do you have a master's? So um, I asked my parents very nicely <laughs> for some money. <laughs> uh, parents are great in that regard. Uh, and I said, look, I need to go and do a master's. So I did some research and I found one at the University of Exeter. Now, if anybody is looking to get into the marine conservation side of things, the University of Exeter, there's nothing better in the UK. It's down in Cornwall at the Penryn campus. So you're in an incredibly nice area. And the laboratories, the lecturers there, you've got, um, hopefully he's still there, I think he still is, it's Professor Brendan Godley. Uh, he's probably number one, number two world expert on sea turtles around the world. Incredibly nice man. He helped me a lot with my thesis, and he actually provided the inspiration to get me to do what I'm doing now in this job. He put me onto this. So, uh, yeah, went and did my master's in Exeter for one year, and then that finished in the August. And then I spent the next two months getting my certifications and qualifications to be able to work at sea. Uh, so I got my BOISIT, which is basic offshore industry safety training. And then I got my MIS, which is minimum industry safety training. I went through a medical. And these are things that are like, um, how do you deal with a fire at sea? And they will put you in a box and set things on fire and you've got to get out. Oh, well, They'll put you uh, <laughs> The most intense one is the helicopter training, which is where they've got a box above a pool. And you've got to look, you've obviously got to be able to swim and everything like that, but they'll put you in a box and then they'll drop it in the water and submerge you. And you've got to get out. You've got to take the windows out and swim to the surface. And in some scenarios, they'll turn it upside down and drop you into the water. Sometimes they'll turn off all the lights. Sometimes they'll make sure one of the windows can't open. So you've got to react. And yeah, so we all passed and that, Things like that. So I took a credit. I think that I took a credit. the calm about the hurricane. <laughs> You've done yeah. that kind of training. Hurricanes, nothing's fine. Um, <laughs> obviously, yeah, hurricanes are a very serious thing. But um, what is it? Uh, yeah, we all passed our boys at missed. I did that with a colleague from university. Uh, we both passed that. And in order to do that, it cost me about two thousand pounds to get all the qualifications that I needed. But uh, again, I took a risk. In case you haven't noticed, uh, I like taking risks. One-way ticket to different countries and stuff. Uh, I took out a credit card, and I paid for it all on my credit card. And then, so I was in debt. I'd got all my qualifications, but again, reaching out to people and saying, "Hey, look, I'm here. Give me a job." They said, "Do you have any experience?" And I went, <laughs> "No." <laughs> and they went, "Okay, come back to me when you've got experience." Uh, so I decided after going through a bit up and down motion as everybody does and everybody will do when going through job hunting, it sucks. Uh, you have your ups and downs, but eventually I decided to focus on one specific country, uh, country company, and I decided to annoy them by sending them an email pretty much once every three days saying, have you got a job? Have you got a job? Have you got a job? And eventually they got back to me in December when I was uh, I was living in the Isle of Malta. I was working with sea turtles there. We were rescuing and rehabilitating them there as well. That was cool. But, um, yeah, they got back to me on around December the 18th. And I was thinking, oh, I'm settled here for Christmas now. I'll be with the family. And they said, all right, there's a job going in England, east coast of England, on December the 27th. If you're there at 9 a.m. on this day, the job's yours. <laughs> and I don't think they expected me to say yes because it was 
in Christmas and New Year's. They were just like, he's not going to say it, but he, he's annoying. <laughs> so much. Much. And then it go away. <laughs> yeah, I just said, okay, I'll see you there. Uh, I booked a flight at Christmas time, flew back to England, drove down to Great Yarmouth. I think it was a beautiful place, lovely place. <laughs> uh, and got on a ship and met my colleague there. And that was it. Uh, it was a two-week job, which turned into three months. So that's another thing about working at sea is never plan your return date. It doesn't. Mm. It never finishes on the day it is, ever. So, yeah, and then once I got that three months experience, I really wanted to work in America. So I annoyed the right companies over in America, and eventually I found the company that I'm working for now. And I've been working with them for the last year, 13 months, and I love it. And I'm going back out there in about two weeks' time, around 10th of September, well, three weeks' time, maybe, around the beginning of September. So, yeah, and that's where we are. There's an awful lot of lessons in there. I think, you know, people sort of expect it to be smooth sailing. Uh, you know, you set your target, get there, with actually that up and down, and not even really knowing what the next step's going to be at times. Yeah, I mean, I've had so many up and downs. I mean, what I could have done, I could have done, I don't know, people wanted to be... Um, they wanted to be teachers, they wanted to be doctors, they wanted to be this, that things with a very structured platform of what they wanted to do. But working in the environment, and it's very, very hard because obviously conservation, it doesn't pay well. It, it doesn't. That's a very honest and brutal fact that I'll say right now. It does not pay well, especially when you're starting off. And this is where it comes to one of my pet peeves of the world, uh, volunteering. The volunteering world can either be incredibly good to you or incredibly horrible because there are, I, I, we were in a lecture at the beginning of when I did my master's in the marine environment and they had these people come in from uh, somewhere in Africa. I won't say the name of the organization, but they were just like, you're going to come out to here and we're going to teach you all how to scuba dive, how to do ecological assessments, how to interact with these animals, how to do this, how to do that, how to do this. And we're only going to take five of you and I could see all my uh, all my colleagues and classmates were all looking at each other going, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. You're not doing it. I'm doing it. Well, began. <laughs> That's it. Got right to the end of the lecture and everybody's on the edge of their seat ready to go and sign up. And then it was just the last bit. Oh, by the way, this is going to cost £5,000. <laughs> so, and then everybody, you literally just see everybody go from this to, uh, never mind. Yeah. Uh, because you can't afford it. Because a lot of, like, even when I have my time off, I, I was look obviously, COVID has been a pain in my bum for this. But I, even I look at volu op volunteering opportunities now just to go and do something with my time off and to travel and to, you know, help out where I can. But some of them I'm seeing are just like, come and live with us for four weeks and help look after injured wolves in California. That will be three and a half thousand pounds, not including your flight, not including your insurance, not including food. We'll put you up in a very small, crappy room. But other than that, you know, so the volunteer world is difficult. Yeah, it's interesting to speak to you because your career path is basically the one I had mapped out for myself when I was younger. Um, but the 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 difficulties you're mentioning are the ones I came up against and I just did not have the money for it. Um, yeah. As someone who's who's made a success out of it, what do you think are the important lessons for people from, from your experiences? What, in life, just to get to... In life, in, in careers, in, you know, whatever you think people need to know. Uh, the first thing that I'd tell everybody, no matter what age they are, well, let's say like 16 up and you're looking at your career and what you want to go into and where and such, you have so much more time than you think you have. Do not rush. Don't feel like you have to go to a certain path straight away and get on it just because somebody else has or you're looking at somebody else who's 10 years older than you and thinking I want to be them now I need to be them now I'm getting pressured you have so much time and that leads to the second bit of advice is if you can go and travel go to different places and meet other people who are because you will meet like-minded people when you go traveling you'll just connect it'll be a weird thing and you'll connect. I've met this. The annoying thing about my job again is that I, I work a lot, but all my friends are all over the world. Mm. Like my best friends are in Dubai or South Africa or Australia. So meeting up is incredibly hard. But it's the like minded people that I've met 
So that's why I'd say is you have so much time. Do not rush into anything. Don't feel pressured or else you're going to get a job when you're 20 just to pay the bills and you're going to still be doing that job when you're 40 and you're going to look back with regret. Just because it's easy doesn't mean you should do it. Take your time and travel. Travel. And that's what I can say. If you can travel, travel. If you can't travel, get a job, save up some money, travel. Take risks. <laughs> Brilliant. I suppose, I suppose, I mean, you've been so generous with your time. Um, yeah. Just the, I suppose, one last question. You've obviously been quite hands-on and, and direct in the career you've had, but that will have taken you all around the environment sector. Yeah. What do you think some of the other, other perhaps jobs and careers that people might not be aware of that are involved in the sector? Uh, well, I mean, everything's achievable if you're willing to do it, if you're willing to put the time and the effort and you have the passion, that's a big thing with conservation and environment. It's you've got to have a passion for the wildlife and or the environment itself. I mean, and everyone I know always has one particular story that just clicked, it changed them and then mm -hmm. said, this is what's going on. Uh, for me, I remember it was, uh, it was a mixture of, if anybody's not seen the film Born Free, go and yeah. watch the film Born Free with Elsa the Lion. And read uh, and read the book. The book's fantastic. But uh, everybody focuses on the lion in that. I choose to focus on the story that's not actually in there, which was the husband of the two there who raised an elephant calf and it was injured. And I remember reading this and it was an elephant calf that was injured and he raised it for a couple of years. And then New York Zoo came calling and said, uh, we need an elephant. So this elephant couldn't survive in the wild. So he sent it to New York, to New York Zoo. And there's this incredibly famous photo uh, so New York City Zoo back then, the elephant enclosure was built like it had a wall and then it had a moat around it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the elephants were on here. So there was a gap between them. And the elephants had been there 20 years. And then the husband came to New York to go and see it. And there's a big crowd of people. And there's this incredibly famous black and white photo of these elephants that wouldn't come near the fence usually, the, the gap. Uh, this elephant's reaching across the gap with its trunk. And he's reaching over. It recognized him after 20 years. And he knew it. Yeah, he knew it. Something. So that reading that story is it just clicked something in my head and said, mm -hmm. I want to work with animals and the environment. And you can do it if you achieve it. It, it. Well, you can do it if you've got the desire to achieve it. But like regarding the certain pathways you can do, I mean, as much as I don't like volunteering, it can be good. It can be a good way to introduce yourself into that world and seeing what it is like. I mean, uh, I do know of a couple of decent volunteering opportunities that won't bankrupt you if anybody's interested. Um, but yeah, I mean, like for what I did as well, there is a, as I said before as well, and this is another choice you can have to make. I'm not saying it's all going to be fairy tales and dreamlands and you're going to find the most amazing environmental job. You do have to make realistic decisions. And as I said, conservation, it doesn't pay well. The job that I'm doing now, uh, it requires sacrifice, but it does pay a lot better than most environmental jobs because of what I'm willing to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I go to sea for, excuse me, I go to sea for months at a time. I don't see family. I don't see friends. I work with people who I don't know. And I live, I can live in a very small hold of a ship for a couple of months above the engine. I've had some bad experience. I've had some great experiences, but I'm doing my part for the environment in my way and I'm getting a good paycheck for it. So you've got to find that balance because you could volunteer or work for something that you're passionate about for a year. But then after that year, you're going to be like, look, I've got no money. Mm. I've got nothing. So you do have to make realistic decisions with what you're doing. With that It's important but, to inform yourself. Yeah. Um, and regarding that is don't be afraid to email people. It sounds weird, but don't. If you're in university and you're reading a, a, a paper, a journal, for instance, and you see it's by Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so, their emails are at the bottom. Don't be afraid to literally send these people an email and say, hey, look, I'm this person, I'm doing this. Nine times out of 10, they will reply. And then you can be like, look, I want to do this. Do you have any advice? And these are people who have been in the profession for 40, 50, 60 years. And they might go, oh, yeah, we know something uh, with blue whales in California. Are you near the area or something? You could be. It's... You know, and then you take yeah, the risk. It's, it's interesting. That sounds quite similar to some of the discussions we've had with other people, you know, making connections and mm. um, not being afraid to talk to people. You never know when they'll come to fruition at, at some point. It might not be now. It might be further down the line. But 
opening those doors for yourself is certainly a theme from the discussions we've had. Yeah, exactly. And don't be afraid because the people who are you're emailing, they're not special, special people. They're people. They're people. And also LinkedIn. Anybody who's not on LinkedIn, get on LinkedIn. LinkedIn's great because obviously it just connects you with so many different people, which is good. But yeah, just don't be afraid to email people and reach out. I mean, what's the worst they can say? No. And then at least you know. And then, yeah, just take it from there. Yeah, that's what yeah. it is. It's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, I, I found it inspiring and fascinating. So hopefully other people will as well. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, just one last little thing, actually. Um, if any of your older students are looking for work in the future in the marine environment, marine conservation, feel free to email me if you want. You can email me if you want, and I can point you in the right direction of the courses that you would need to get, and I can give you at least five different companies who would take a chance and hire you. Brilliant. So, Brilliant. I'll make sure they know that. Thank you so much. Uh, no worries, Satan. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.